Awesome. So just a heads up to all who have just joined us that we are recording this session. Uh, please also uh, be considered of the bandwidth. So, so if you would please uh, minimize your screen and mute your mic, that would be incredible because we are ready for a fantastic morning uh, with you today. Um, my name is Katie Lewis Pryor and I'm the experiential learning consultant for the Ottawa Catholic School Board and it is our pleasure to host uh, today's meet which includes students from both the Ottawa Catholic School Board and the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. And with me today is our incredible community partner from the Ottawa, I was with San Ontario, Network for Education, Christina Price. Christina, if you want to introduce yourself this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Price from JA Ottawa and the Ottawa Network for Education. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you panelists for taking the time um, to share about your careers. I'm passionate about career exploration and so I'm very excited about this day. Typically, um, I lead the, the questions in this, but for today, um, my colleague Katie's going to do it because this, like she said, this is right up her alley. So we're just gonna first uh, start off by doing the indigenous land acknowledgement, um, acknowledging that the land that we're all on today uh, for this World of Choices event is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin nation. Back over and to you, Katie. Yeah, and, and actually just to continue on that, I, hopefully some of you saw that supermoon earlier this week. Uh, the, I was looking on uh, one of the websites because I used to be the Indigenous Studies Consultant uh, for the board, and there are actually 13 moons that the uh, Algonquin people marked seasons and times by, and we've just headed into a fifth moon, which is the flower moon, and it's a time of planting uh, where it's supposed to be a spiritual time when we look into ourselves deeply and consider healing. And I think a lot of those things reflect pretty well with our, our uh, times now with the pandemic. So uh, we'll continue on with our day. We'll start with some introductions to our incredible panel this morning. Uh, first up, uh, we're going to introduce you to Adrian Hipwood on my screen. He is directly to my right. Uh, we're so happy to have Adrian on the call with us today. Adrian is a host for CBC News Ottawa, so you've probably seen him on the air. And if you are one of our Cappy schools, you may have seen uh, Adrian a couple of years ago present at our gala. So welcome today to Adrian. Um, Jamal Jackson Rogers, also on the line with us today. Good friend, Ottawa slam poet. Uh, he has also been the Ottawa English Poet Laureate. He has won an Emerging Artist Award from OVC and is in the hip hop group, Miss Links. I didn't realize that until I looked at your bio, Jamal. So uh, I want to definitely hear a little bit about writing hip hop lyrics this morning. So welcome to you. Uh, also on the line, new to me, and I'm really excited to hear uh, about her career journey is Megan Piercy Montefiel. And am I saying your whole name properly, Megan? Perfect. And Megan is a writer who's done community engagement and not-for-profit work in marketing and communication. So a little bit on that business side, which is great because that uh, always good to know what the options are out there. And she's been a manager for, and she's done that marketing and communications work for Onfi, uh, who is uh, our huge uh, network sponsor today. Um, she is a playwright and has been a playwright in residence for GCTC and that has been the same, I believe, for Ottawa Fringe Festival. So a huge welcome to Megan this morning. Uh, two more incredible people. Somebody I actually went to elementary school with. I got to try that out again, Caroline. Um, Caroline Pignat is a teacher, a writer, um, a novelist. Uh, many of our students who are on the call today have probably read, uh, read her work. Uh, such as Egghead, The Gospel Truth, uh, The Green and Grass Trilogy. Um, she is a Governor General Award winner for two books. Uh, those were Greener Grass and Gospel Truth. And she also writes poetry in April is Poetry Month. So it's also pretty great to have both uh, Caroline as a poet and Jill on the line as poets today during uh, April Poetry Month. And finally, not last but not least, Heather Wright. Uh, she has a degree in English from Bishops and has done a lot of career exploration. So I'm actually really excited about your career path as well, Heather, and to hear about it because you did a lot of different things. 
uh, banking, marketing, project management. Uh, you were a chef, a freelance writer, and now you're the managing editor, editor of Our Homes Ottawa magazine. So we're really, really excited to have you on the line as well this morning. So let's get um, started. Um, pretty excited about um, everybody being here today. I would like to start by asking when you knew you wanted a job that included the literary arts or English in it, how early on was that for you? And we'll start with you, Adrian. Oh, can't hear you, Adrian. Oh, we're having problems with Sam. We're gonna give you a minute, Adrian, and we'll get back to you. Uh, Heather, how about yourself? When did you know that you wanted something to do with English? Because you've had quite a long career path. Thank yeah, it's, uh, it's been quite circular and zigzaggy. Um, I would say uh, on some level, I've always known, uh, but it took, you know, the better part of 10, 15 years before I committed um, and, and said, yeah, I can make a career out of this. So hence the trying out everything else first. <laughs> but there was a lot in common with a lot of those jobs that came back to writing and communications and stuff like that. Um, and the sort of the creative aspect of it. I was going to ask, how did you end up in banking? Was it because you wanted something that you felt was, you know, solid? Because we always hear that, you know, the stereotype of the starving artist. Was it that you wanted something that was uh, kind of grounding? Or how did you end up getting into banking? Before well, you ended it's, up uh, I'd like to say it was a, a lot more thought out and more inspired. Uh, but they're the ones that called me back. <laughs> <laughs> right out of school and uh yeah and I actually spent uh three or four years doing right. that and uh I knew pretty early on it wasn't for me but uh it sort of takes some time I think to come to that realization and you get life skills along the way so uh that I was later able to write about so it's not wasted time can you tell me about some of those uh, life skills that you would have picked up that help you in your career now? Well, I found, you know, when I eventually established myself as a freelancer, um, that it's not necessarily enough to be able to write well, although that's, um, you know, certainly part of it. Um, but you're much more able to market your skills if you can write about something um, with some sort of, you know, background knowledge. And um, from the banking, actually, I got a lot of uh, sort of learning in personal finance, mortgages, um, ended up doing a whole thing in uh, mining from that mining, uh, because I ended up uh, as an editor for a, a junior investor service uh, on, on junior mining stocks. So it's, you sort of got um, a lot of, I guess, more practical knowledge that that people were interested in, in hiring you to write about. So, gotcha. yeah. So it's the background, I guess. Okay. Same question, Jamal. Um, when did you know that writing was in your future? I was nine years old. I was nine years old when, um, and so if we're talking about this over two decades ago, um, I was nine years old and uh, I realized the, what, that words have power in a really transformative way. I was in grade four and uh, I didn't uh, speak, I didn't have a North American English accent. I had a Patois English accent. And when I recited my first poem in front of a class, uh, thinking that I would be humiliated uh, because of my accent, which I, I was often, I was often teased because of my accent, uh, my Guyanese accent, that um, uh, I was surprised when, the, when the, the class stood up for me and applauded me. And that's when I realized that words have power and my love for writing poetry and expressing myself through, uh, you know, poetic devices uh, uh, was cemented. So uh, from that point on, actually, I, I had told myself I wanted to be an English teacher um, simply because I wanted, I was in ESL and I wanted to help um, students, uh, you know, get through ESL and find success, you know, with the language that they are, are, are adopting. So uh, I had, at that time, I wanted to be an English teacher and I didn't think necessarily poetry was going to, a poetry career was going to um, uh, emerge, but um, 
I knew that as an English teacher, I'd be able to teach poetry. Uh, but, you know, things changed over time and I, and I decided to just go with exactly, um, you know, that was calling me, which is um, uh, being a, a writer and performer and arts educator in the form of poetic expression. And was there a poet that really inspired you or a, and we know that you love hip hop or a rapper that, that really uh, pushed you onto that journey as well? There was. Um, it's actually a poet named Langston Hughes, a poet who's a playwright, uh, as well as an act known as an activist and and um, and a storyteller. He, uh, when I first read his poem in grade four, uh, Harlem, he reflected yeah. exactly how I felt being new to Ottawa. Uh, the poem is about ha uh, Langston's um, opinion uh, of poetic opinion uh, of Harlem and uh, the difficulties um, growing up and experiencing Harlem. So when he wrote that poem, and I, well, when, when I read that poem, uh, I, I immediately realized that poetry has a way of telling, of, of reflecting who you are or reflecting how you see the world so, so you know, uh, uh, precisely with, with language. And so Langston has always been a poet I return to because uh, he captures feeling and sincerity and intent so uh, precisely and accurately, at least to my, in, in my impression. So, yeah, uh, and, in, and in rap music, um, I'm currently investigating and doing a lot of research on uh, just Kendrick Lamar and rappers that came out of Compton, rappers that came out of some of the most difficult uh, circumstances and uh, found ways to um, uh, transform their stories into inspiring messages. So uh, rappers like Kendrick Lamar and D Smoke, both from Compton, uh, incredibly inspire my work because I tend to use um, a kind of a method from tragedy to triumph in my writing and my presentations. I love both of those poets. Langston Hughes I used to teach when I was an English teacher at St. Mark and I've definitely been exposed to Kendrick Lamar because my oldest son is a huge, huge fan. So really incredibly brilliant writing, um, especially his last album. Adrian, let's test your sound and see yeah. how we're doing. I think it's working now. My apologies for that. That's all good. Technology is sometimes not our friend, so we're happy that the gods of technology are working now. Talk about your career path as well. Did you, uh, were you the type of person who was always asking questions when you were little? How did you know that you wanted to be where you are now? You know, well, first of all, I feel as if Jamal was trying to show me up because when I was nine, that was that was four decades ago, not not two decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dating myself, but um, and I wanted to be a soccer player <laughs> when I was a kid. I think that was that was my. I wanted to be Pele, which also dates me uh, back to the back to the 1970s. But um, you know, I think when I when I went to university, I I was uh, I'm an activist. I, I was a student activist, and it was a time of apartheid, and it was a time of change. Uh, Nelson Mandela was still in jail when I first went to university in 1989. Um, so media was about, I was interested in change. I was interested right. in changing the world. And I saw, I saw journalism, I saw media as a way of doing it, uh, doing that. It was a way, it was an instrument, a powerful instrument that could be used to raise people's consciousness. It was something that could be used to, to disseminate information. Uh, it was a way in which we could reduce some of the harm that has been caused um, by intervening, by being involved, uh, by rep being represented in these spaces. Uh, so for us, really, we saw it as being a tool. Uh, right. And I, I didn't really see journalism as a career, per se. It was a means to an end. Uh, and, it was, and it was a way of upending things uh, yes. and, and, and making, making, yeah, it's, I'm just reiterating, but making change. So um, the, the interesting thing is my parents are educators, uh, but they were also journalists. So in the 1970s, both my parents were columnists for the main a black uh, newspaper in Canada called Contrast. So I grew up in a household where I saw my parents' bylines and, and I saw, I guess, the power of journalism, although I never kind of imagined it for myself. But I, I right. realize now that I, I certainly, perhaps some of the choices that I made, were, were it was informed by that background, by having a newspaper around, uh, by being engaged in, in political talk uh, around the kitchen table uh, in, in large part because of my, because of my folks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adrian. Megan, same question. Where did it start for you? Uh, so I, I uh, was sort of taught in school that there was, there was no real, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't get a job through studying English. 
Um, that was the message I received from my parents and, and, and also from, from some teachers to a certain extent. And so while I was really good at English and I also, I just loved reading. I was the kid with like always nose in a book. Um, it was very much like a dismissed, like, oh, that's nice, but like, you know, do something real. Um, and so it wasn't until I was out of my undergrad that, and you know, no more grades, no more you're kind of out in the world with, you know, nobody's watching over to see what you're doing, um, that I found that the thing that I needed to do for myself and sort of needed to feel happy was to write. Um, right really until sort of the expectations of teachers and parents and all that was kind of stripped away that I was able to see like this is the thing that I really care about. Now I've been uh, as part of a different series I've been interviewing a lot of theater artists for, for Cappy's Presents and um, a lot of those artists have two or three jobs that they're doing um, to bring in uh, money and to keep things going. So how important do you think flexibility is for a person who is going into um, an English career or specifically your sorts of careers that you're taking part in? That's a great question. I think, I mean, I think flexibility is really useful skill and attribute in life in general. Um, for me, I kind of, so I, I worked for, for, for about 10 years, as a, like a freelancing artist and, you know, taking whatever contracts possible um, in theater and writing and in facilitation. Um, and I sort of found through that process for myself that um, after a while, I wanted to separate my art from my economic reality. Um, for myself as an artist, I felt like, you know, I was, I was just constantly looking for you know, something to make money to live on um, and not able then to to kind of write what I really cared about. And so so that's how it happened for me. I think a lot of artists get a lot out of freelancing. They love it and they, they stick with it. Um, but I kind of stepped back and said, okay, well then what is the skill that I have that, that, um, that somebody will give me a, a more stable job with and, and found that really, you know, writing is, is a, a great skill that that a lot of places need and really contrary to what I was taught as I was coming through school it is actually a very valuable marketable skill well and I think especially now in in the days of, of internet where you know everything is online and needs content being produced that yes. you know that old idea of um, again, and I was shared that idea, if you went into English, well, you were going to be a teacher or you were going to be a journalist. There, there wasn't the, and it wasn't that there weren't careers out there, it's just those were the ones that people talked about. So I think that it's just changed astronomically. Uh, Caroline, we're gonna turn things over to you. Same question. Uh, I think it started for me uh, with a dead hamster. <laughs> when I was in grade two, uh, my hamster Snoozy died and I wrote a poem about it. And it was the first poem I remember sharing with somebody. I gave it to my teacher, Miss Beauvert. And she she was the first person other than my mom to, to say, like, that's really good. Or she got it. Or that you must feel really sad about that. Like, it was the first time I remember feeling like a connection through something I wrote, which was a powerful thing. I didn't know you could do that, right? I always thought writing was for football. Well, at six, seven years old, it was for homework, right? Um, and I and I I started doing a lot of journaling and writing, and I wrote poems all through high school. And um, it was always something I loved doing. I never really thought it was something I would do as a career. Um, the teachers also made me feel like I could be a great teacher as well. And I really wanted to do the same thing for other students that Miss Bovere did for me. That kind of affirming their voice and encouraging their talent. So uh, I pursued teaching and I, I didn't really get back into writing until university when uh, my professor at Ottawa U in my undergrad would have me read aloud some of the things I'd written. And it was another one of those, wow, like I didn't think this was anything all that great, but I'm getting great feedback from people that don't have to say anything to me. Um, so I, I, I think of myself as a, a writer who can teach. Um, and my dad was is uh, a musician who who can do art. So he earned his income as an artist, 
but I'd say he's a musician. And, and even with me, I think the teaching informs the writing because I write for teenagers. I write novels and mainly for teenagers. Um, knowing them that closely and working with them every day helps me write something that I think is relevant to them and, and feels authentic. And then also uh, it, it makes me a better writer, but it also makes me a better teacher, I think. So I, I like that when you pursue something you're passionate about, they inform each other. It's kind of like, like I'm Irish, so I kind of think of it like an Irish stew, that whatever you're throwing in there, whatever experience <laughs> you do, like I was Santa's elf at Carlingwood Mall when I was 17. I know that's going to come out in a story at some point, right? <laughs> so it all goes into the plot. And, and I think that's really cool how you see it comes back again, right? Like I used to write poems trees when I was in grade two and three, and I just, my children's picture book poetry is about tree poems about trees that was uh, one of the more recent things that came out so i love that now that i'm getting older i'm, I'm like you adrian I'm, I'm 50 this year so you're looking back and you're seeing the the, the the cycle right it's all making sense when you're going through it sometimes it feels like a gong show and you're like i don't know what's happening here i'm all over the map but if you think of it like a stew and all the pieces come together and it it turns into something rich like i like i like looking at it like that Caroline, oh, I think I, I saw you at Car Carlingwood Mall. I was a caretaker back then. <laughs> you, you, you did, huh? I did. I worked there. Yeah. You were a caretaker? I was. I was. Well, I was, I was a, they called it a janitor back then. Uh, well, that, that, uh, that Santa was creepy, and that's all I'm going to say Going back to what you were saying, Caroline, I completely agree with you. Because, I mean, I went through and did an English degree, uh, sorry, a journalism degree. And I remember hitting fourth year and it was a recession that I was graduating into. And I thought, I'm not going to get a job. So I might as well go back and do my English degree. And then I went ahead and went to teacher's college after that. But I used my journalism skills every day. Yeah. You know, whether it was when I was in the classroom asking uh, students questions, uh, trying to get to the heart of things or the research that I would do when I was, um, you know, trying to pull together a unit. Um, and even now, I mean, who would have thought I would be doing, you know, uh, an interview panel as part of the, the system work I'm doing at the board. So completely agree with you. And also I'm in that 50 category with you, Adrian, as well. <laughs> so there, we're a bit of a club this morning. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, Adrian, your work, because not only are you a journalist, you've done uh, two very different mediums. So you started, correct me if I'm wrong with this, you started in radio uh, with CBC, but now you're in TV. Could you talk a little bit about the differences with those mediums and what kind of skills uh, transfer across and what new skills you had to learn? You know, I should say, but I actually started in community radio. So I, I, I worked in community radio as a volunteer and then I, I managed the McGill station for a couple of years. So I was in community radio for about 10 years. Um, I think it's so much of, so much of journalism is about listening and, 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 and so much is about paying attention and, and, and recognizing, uh, the fact that everyone has a story to tell, uh, and that everyone deserves dignity. Right. So I think that's where it starts that one has to kind of pay attention and one has to honor the subjects that one is, is, has the privilege of engaging with. Um, I think the other thing that, 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 um, is required another quality that's required both on radio and also TV is curiosity, right? Um, being wanting to know, wanting to know more, wanting to ask questions. Um, those I think are really the key things. I think also having empathy, right? Uh, and and being able to kind of imagine yourself in the shoes of another individual. Um, all of those things help both in TV and in radio. Um, I think that obviously with television, one has to get at some point comfortable with being on on television i'll tell you really really briefly i was awful the first couple <laughs> times when i was on when i when i started anchoring on tv my, my wife told me i was terrible i had <laughs> first, first i finished right so so you have to be gentle with yourself you have to give yourself time you know there's this thing that revolution is not instant coffee right so it takes time we're all in the process of becoming Right, like Michelle right. Obama's book, we're all in the process of becoming. So it takes time. So it took me time to become comfortable. I wasn't comfortable initially uh, when I was anchoring. Uh, I was much more familiar with the kind of radio format, and that that's radio is kind of my first love. Right, right. so it didn't take as much work. I had to work a lot harder 
uh, to become even adequate on TV. And my wife and my sister would say, I'm still struggling to achieve that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's a process. But really, you know, be gentle with yourself and recognize that it takes time. But you also have to invest the time, right? And you have to practice. Practice is so important, right? Just going over things and, and being humble and recognizing and going over your work and watching yourself fail uh, and watching yourself succeed and learning from all of those things. And I love that you shared about the volunteer experience. It was at CKCU, if I remember from reading your, your uh, yeah, bio. Yeah, no, I actually worked at four different stations. So I volunteered wow. at CKCU. I also did programming at CHUO, Ottawa U. I did a program for a number of years at CKLN, Radio Ryerson. Uh, and then, of course, I was at, at uh, Radio McGill, where I, I, I was the station manager there. Right. And so uh, when you're thinking about um, the writing that you did back then, as an anchor, are you still able to, because you're doing a lot of presenting work, how much time do you get to write still? Is it as much as it used to be? Uh, it's probably not as much as it was when I was doing radio. So when I was when I was hosting the afternoon show in the city, you know, we were often doing what maybe nine interviews a day, uh, and right. I was responsible usually for a couple of those interviews. Right now, in the position that I, I have on our show, I'm usually responsible mainly just for the questions. I actually have a producer that helps to write the intro. Uh, so I'm pretty lazy, you know. Like it's a wonder they even pay me. <laughs> And I don't know why, you know, I, I'm very, I'm very fortunate that way. Um, but I miss it. Like I love, I'm a write, I'm a writer and I love, I love to write. I don't get as a chance to write as much as I used to, uh, that, that, in, if truth be told in, in the current position I hold. Thanks, Adrian. Um, we have a question in the chat from uh, Ms. Taylor. Um, I think I'm going to start this question with you, uh, Heather, if you don't mind. Sure. The question that uh, she's written is, some artists fall into the thinking that, that to have a fallback is a danger to your career as an artist. What does having another job offer you as an artist, um, and how do you make time for your art? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, having a fallback is part of the process. Um, I don't. I don't think being an artist and having a day job, or uh, or a pragmatic job, um, that that's going to pay your bills. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, I think that you need to to trust your vision um, and 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 sort of see what you have to do in real steps to get you there, um, which is certainly what I did, you know, with my sort of weird and wild uh, career path. But I even, when I decided I once and for all was going to freelance and eventually uh, become established in that, I had two young children and I went out and waitressed it in the evenings, um, you know, and then thinking I would, would make time uh, during the day to write, which I did, but it took a lot longer um, than I thought it would because, uh, you know, it, it comes back to time management um, too uh, and having the opportunity. But if it's really important to you, um, you will find a way to, to find that time, that creative time and and it helps to 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 sort of have i think um different jobs or different opportunities along the way because it gives you a little bit of perspective too and it sort of reinforces some of your choices or it reveals that some of your choices are mistakes um and and you don't necessarily have to, mistakes aren't always mistakes um if you end up where you want to be right so uh, right yeah. And I think you learned an awful lot from your mistakes. I mean, yeah. certainly the things that always went easily for me, I didn't learn as much from them as I did from the things that didn't go well. Yeah, absolutely. Jamal, I think you would probably have a lot to add to that question as well, too, because you really have a lot of different careers on the go at the same time. You're an arts educator, you're a poet. I know in the past you've done uh, work for Youth Ottawa as well, and I know that you have a, an incredible schedule that you spend a lot of time juggling. Can you talk about the value of, of all of those different opportunities? Well, um, I spent a, a, a good amount of time in my professional career since I left post-secondary education uh, working uh, in fields that I'm very passionate about. 
I'm very thankful that I'm grateful that the those fields ended up being ha, having a lot of transferable skills to what I do now. So I, I studied um, uh, early childhood education. I, ch I studied child studies. Again, I wanted to be a teacher, right? And so working with youth, students, uh, even adult learners um, was a passion of mine already. And uh, so engaging with audiences and being someone who is, you know, either a mentor or an educator was very natural to me already. And I had a whole bunch of different, like, uh, I ideas and programs that I was running for the longest time, never thinking that poetry could sustain me. But it was my mentor, uh, Jalal uh, Lightning Rod uh, Nuruddin, who is the founding father of the uh, historical spoken word group, The Last Poets, and who's also credited with being one of the, grand, uh, the godfathers of hip hop. He told me that Jamal, you know, when I asked him one time, uh, I said, you know, Jalal, I'm so close to being a full-time artist. Uh, I have like seven different jobs that I'm doing right now, uh, and none of them are arts-centered and focused. And then I got a bunch of other, you know, contract work uh, opportunities that are arts-focused. And I feel like I'm ready to make the big leap to being a professional artist. And he told me, uh, uh, you know, a piece of advice that changed uh, my life, essentially. I decide, He said, Jamal, when all of your art can sustain you, um, and replace all of the other jobs you're doing, that's when you know it's time to make the decision. Uh, and he said specifically because I was a father, right? And so um, when, I, when he told me that, that's all I did. I basically said, okay, um, let me now build more opportunities for myself. Instead of waiting for opportunities to come to me or someone to call me at home, I said, let me um, study, learn, and build more opportunities for myself so that way I'm a, a person who comes with a lot of assets and a lot of value. And so over the last uh, 12 years, I've been uh, immersing myself in different uh, areas of artistic expression so that I'm more valuable to the artistic community here in Ottawa. So I've learned how to put on events. I've learned how to run a nonprofit and start a nonprofit as well, too. I've learned how to run a community-based arts uh, studio and performance center. Um, I've learned how to be an arts educator and songwriting educator and so on and so forth and book tours, write grants. When I combine all these things, it helped me to now leverage um, my potential as a creative. And so that way I'm not, I, I have little, I spend little time waiting for opportunities to come to me. I can either make my own when things are dry and make my own events and put on my own productions, or um, I have so many skills that I can offer uh, to the community that I'm getting, you know, uh, regular booking. So it's about, you know, understanding how you can really immerse yourself in um, that format that you're studying. Think of some of the, you know, some of the most famous people in the world who you think would be able to retire just making music, for example. They have so many uh, different endeavors going on because they know that they want to be able to um, ha diversify their portfolio. So it's really important to think about when you want to make that move from being maybe a hobbyist or part time and then to, a, uh, you know, full time, that it is OK to go staggered. It's definitely OK to have, uh, you know, other uh, occupations or side hustles going on. And I think they refine find you in the end and they help to clarify your path more. So uh, what, one of the big things I just took from that, other than that, I like that hustle, that entrepreneurship piece, but one of the other things that you talked about right at the beginning was mentorship. Could you talk a little bit about how you find a mentor that is going to make a difference in your life? Mentors, I have, I have one mentor right now in my life um, currently, um, and she is just uh, she's a theater practitioner and uh, I don't know you know I would feel lost even though it may look like from a from a you know optic standpoint people see me on social media they see me it might look like I have everything under control a mentor is someone who grounds you on your path and helps you to stay connected to your mission vision and to your artistic statements right your philosophy and so uh, I found out the importance of mentors when I got into arts education my first mentor being a poet he suggested me for a position at mass because he was leaving the position and he said, I think Jamal could take that position at MASK. And MASK is an organization that puts artists and connects them with schools and communities. And I was like, I don't know much about, I know a lot about poetry, but teaching poetry, I don't know. I teach other things, right? And they said, well, give it a shot. I did my, and because he believed in me, mentors offer an incredible right, support system. He believed in me. 
even though I had not done 12 years ago a, a poetry workshop or exchange before or, you know, facilitated any of the such. So mentors are, are there are mentors out there. There are people who are willing to pass on their knowledge. And if you can find the earlier, of course, you know, with, you know, if you have, if you need a parent guardian to be an intermediary, but the earlier that you can find a mentor in the thing that you want to do, the much better it is for you. They're an awesome support system. They'll tell you the pitfalls you should avoid, uh, especially if they're still active and they will be, you know, uh, kind of like that, that, uh, that encouraging ear or encouraging voice, I should say to you as you continue to progress and develop in your journey, because sometimes you reach a plateau, you might not know what's next. A mentor who has experience will be able to show you how to transition or to carry forward um, from, from what you've been building and to create legacy. So I currently have a mentor and I'm in my mid late thirties. I have a mentor and she works with me often and I suggest it for, for everybody. Totally agree, totally agree. Um, continuing to, to talk about mentors, but also your peers who are in the same community as you. Caroline, could you tell us a little bit about writing and how much of it you share with other people to get their opinions like are you in a writer's circle where you show your early work uh, to people to get feedback yeah that's a great question and when jamal was talking i was thinking about that that there i i don't know if i have like my editor's been somebody obviously through my career but uh it's been writing groups and 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 those change i i, I took a writing workshop uh, that's an important thing, I think, to mention, too, to keep learning your craft. You're never done learning. And that's going to keep inspiring what you do and, and take you in new directions. So I'm always going to writing workshops as a participant. I give them as well. And uh, at the very first one I went to, by it was by Rachna Gilmore in Ottawa. I met five, there were four other ladies, there were five of us, and none of us had been published. And that's how we started um, We'd meet once uh, once every couple of weeks and we would share what we'd written and give each other feedback just like you do in school where your teacher makes you do peer editing. That's actually a legit thing. <laughs> and, uh, that's how Egghead, my first novel, started. Um, just getting that feedback. And, and, and it was interesting because I didn't always do what they would suggest, but it kind of opened my eyes to things I hadn't thought about. And you think you've said something clearly and the feedback helps you see how maybe it wasn't as clear as it should have been. Um, the, the later I got in my career, um, the, the group kind of disbanded, but I stayed in touch with the ladies and one of them is an editor. So she would read my work for me. Um, I still get my, my husband to read my work whenever I finish something, he'll read the whole, uh, book and give me feedback. And when I was teaching writer's craft for quite a few years, it was awesome. It was like having a, a writer's group every morning and getting paid to go to it. <laughs> <laughs> we shared, like I would do the writing prompts with the kids and we would share what we'd been working on and you just like we're all on the same level we're all beginning a new project like I just I find that really inspiring being around other artists um, just to add to what you were talking there about um, balancing everything when I was when I was teaching I did find that overwhelming to try and write at the same time and people have been asking about your day job and your other job um, right. I started to realize it's like you're, you're always going to make a choice. So do I want to choose to go all in with this writing thing and put all my eggs in that basket? I did try that when my kids were home. I was home full time with them and I, I was trying to do freelance writing. And it, it put so much pressure on getting something published and getting this article sold and getting $100 from the citizen for this article that I sold them that it took the joy out of it, honestly, because I was I was trying to churn out what I thought would sell. So right. teaching part time, and I, I reduced my schedule, which is what I do now so that I, I can teach and I can earn enough that it pays the bills. And all the writing is gravy. So that's like, when I sold a book, we went to Disney and I felt like, well, we're here because I sold a book and it feels like yeah. you're celebrating what you had achieved. For me to create, I need to have that pressure off. So, you know, I think that's important. Kids, you think about yourselves as students, when you have an assignment, what, what motivates you to do it? That you're passionate about what you're writing about, you know, that you care about what it is, you're curious about it. If you're, I, I always say it's like being infatuated with your current work in progress. If, if, if I'm totally obsessed with bog bodies in Ireland, which I actually am right now, that's what I'm researching for my current <laughs> book. It's a weird thing, but whenever I have free time, that's what I'm looking up, that's what I'm researching. And you don't have to make time for that because 
you're so into it, right? So yeah. it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like homework, which when I was doing freelance writing kind of felt like assignments I didn't want to do, right? Right. So that's because how it was some because it was somebody else's idea, somebody else's passion. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, there was a question in the chat from Ms. Tellerico, and I want to uh, just, you sort of touched on it, uh, Caroline, but I also want to ask Megan this question as well. So, I mean, that would have been a big leap and kind of scary to go into writing a book, like when you decided you were going to take time off from school, because, you know, I'm sure at that point there was no promise that it was going to sell or that, you know, you were going to be able to, um, you know, get it published. So. What was that like and how did you get over that fear? How did you just go ahead anyway? Are you asking me or Megan? Yes. Yeah, I'm you. asking you, but then I'm going to go to Megan. Sorry. Uh, so how did I get over the fear of wondering? Like, there are things you can't control in any career, right? So the, I like the stability of teaching and knowing I have a paycheck that's this much money every, every couple of weeks. Um, you can't control if your product, once you create something, it becomes a product and then you try and sell it. And that's a whole other set of skills that I think authors and Jamal was touching on that, developing yourself in a bunch of other ways. So I try to just let that go and put it out there and, and keep doing like, I, I'm, there's great organizations that help you like Canscape and SCBWI child, uh, writing organizations that can teach you the skills about submitting and trying to sell your product. But really, then you have to let it go because I can't control how many kids are going to buy the book or like it. So even though I thought the first book I was going to be like on Oprah and famous and in her book club and, you know, life will be easy. I realized even after two Gigi awards and seven books, I still, I still have to teach to pay my bills. So for me, that's just the reality of it. And, and it took me a while to get to a point where I'm like, that's okay. I can only control what I'm creating and I'm just going to keep creating whatever I feel inspired about. So that's kind of how I dealt with the fear of it. Awesome. Thank you. And Megan, so your take on that, like, because you are doing a bunch of different things and you've done things in your past that have been scary and have probably been a leap, like doing those artist residencies. Yeah, I, I'm actually uh, quite similar to, to oh, Karen. I think you're frozen. Oh no. No, I can hear her. I can hear you now. Maybe it was mine. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to collect my thoughts because there's so much great stuff everybody's saying to, to respond to. But um, I, I'm very similar to, to Caroline in that I, I feel like, like that my career or life is a stew. It all sort of informs each other. And um, I also felt a similar way in freelancing that um, that I was starting to just do work to feed what was trendy or to feed what was what would sell, and then eventually got to the point where I was like, "Where my where's my vision? Where did it go?" Um, and and to speak to the mentor or the peer question, um, I do think it's really important to 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 find your people within your artistic. Um, I guess like to, to find the people that you really admire, even if they don't do the same thing as you. So some of my peers um, who I really admire are novelists and I'm not a, like, I don't write in that way, but um, I find their work really inspiring and I try to, to keep in touch with them and, and writing can be kind of lonely because it is a solo endeavor most of the time. And so it can feel after a while, like, Oh, I'm just, I'm here by myself. Like, is anyone out there? <laughs> So to have sort of peers to reach out to who like even throughout the pandemic not being able to get together i'll send them an email once in a while and we'll have a bit of an exchange of you know how's it going and and these people are really important to me because in part they're important to me for a number of reasons but something that they do for me is they also sort of believe in their in their artistic vision and they will hold their peers myself and others to the same thing of are you putting out into the world what you really care about? Right. Are you thinking about the implications of what you're putting out into the world? Um, because I do think it's important to, what we put out into the world is important and what we, um, you know, the, the effects that we can have. Um, so having peers that kind of hold 
me to that sense of responsibility in the work is important. Um, I don't know now if I'm answering the question, actually. Oh, this I think you are. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that life is unpredictable and it is like, like that's been said that you, you don't know what's going to happen in any career. Um, and while it's scary to do things, to make certain decisions from passion, um, life is really boring if you don't make any decisions out of passion. But, you know, like it. There's an adrenaline that comes with making those big choices. And a sense of direction too, of like, I'm doing this because I really care about it. Right. Um, and so that gets me up in the morning. That gives me a sense of life and motivation um, that, that always serving, you know, what seems to be the practical choice um, that might not make you happy. And that um, it might not even have, end up being that practical. Like, like, right. saying, like learning that the practical thing is not to use English skills in a career. Like <laughs> that wasn't actually good advice that didn't bear out. In, in the world. Can I say one uh, thing, Katie? Can I, can I, just, absolutely. I, I just want to encourage the students out there to invest in relationships, right? Invest in relationships because those relationships will help you. Um, we all go through really tough times and, and, and difficult times. I, I, I've struggled um, at moments in my, in my career and I really have leaned on people. You know, people have lifted me up. Uh, people, uh, there's so many people who have helped me. Uh, and I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for those relationships. Um, and, and those are relationships that are predictable. Uh, you know, yeah. Megan was talking about the fact that so much, you know, is there's so much unpredictability. Uh, but, but having those kinds of mainstay, having those, that, 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 that solid foundation that you can turn to is really, really important. I can also say, and, and it's not, um, there's a material effect as well. And, you know, like the fact is that that I have been in, informed about jobs by my network. You know, friends have told me this is this is available. This is available. Uh, had I not, for example, had a network, I wouldn't have become the station manager at McGill. I was told about that job uh, by by my sister and and some friends. Uh, there have been numerous other positions that I've gained thanks to the network that I've been able to develop to, to cultivate. So again, you know, that's just a life thing. Like just invest in relationships uh, because it does come back to you. And it also exactly, you know, um, Jamal was saying the same thing. He had a friend who talked to him about the job at Mask and, and helped him get that job. So, or, you know, let him know about it so he could, uh, you know, take a shot at it. Um, I want to turn a little bit and talk about, we are starting to close in and about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to talk a little bit about accuracy um, and getting things right. And I'd like to talk about that with uh, you, Adrian, and with Heather. And we'll start with you, Adrian, because in your job, you're sharing um, all the news that's out there that uh, to help inform people with the choices they're making and let them know about the world around them. So if you could talk a little bit about how important getting it right is in your job. Yeah, well, we, we, we know how much damage can be caused by misinformation. And, and particularly in a world where things are traveling at such speeds, you know, wrong information can cause a lot of harm, can cause a lot of damage. So it's important that we double and tri triple check our work and, and try to be as accurate as possible. Invariably, we're going to make mistakes. And, and that happens from time to time. And then, of course, when you notice that mistake, you, you, you try to correct it you know, as soon as possible. Uh, but really, uh, you are always trying to uh, be as precise and as meticulous as possible. Uh, there's sometimes that uh, you, you feel the pressure to release the information quickly because, because you know, you, you want to be first. Uh, right. But sometimes being first isn't everything that it's, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, it seems kind of attractive, uh, but, but it's, not, it's not the most important thing. All right. It's not yeah. the most important thing. Like at the end of the day, you want the information to be genuine and authentic and, and, and you want to be able to verify what you're, what you're doing. Uh, and that, and that process of verification, of course, is very, very key. It's very, very important in journalism. And ultimately it's about your credibility. 
right? It's about exactly. your, the only thing that you have is your reputation. And, and if, and if you play with that a little bit too much, it will affect your ability to do the work that you want to do because people won't trust you. Right. And, and trust is so important when it comes to journalism uh, and writing, of course, um, people don't like being duped. Right. Uh, and people get very, very resentful when you have um, misled them. Right. So it's very, very important for your own professional re reputation to try to get it right the first time. And Heather, you know, even down to I remember from J school that, you know, even something as basic and fundamental as getting somebody's name spelled yes. correctly is such a crucial piece of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was going to say that uh, as part of a, the function of, of my job um, as managing editor of our homes, that I spend, I would say, as much time uh, fact checking, um, confirming spellings of names, uh, different details, uh, as I do in actually um, organizing the content and writing myself. Uh, it's it's extremely important, um, as Adrian, you were saying, in, in terms of establishing that credibility and that trust, uh, because people are, I mean, for, for our magazine, um, you know, it's, it's pretty light. Um, it's not hard hitting journalism exactly, but uh, they, they want to be able to have accurate information um, and that we're representing uh, the, the homeowners and uh, our different uh, people in our stories accurately uh, as well and we actually have a very collaborative process with with the people that we interview and that participate in our um, in our stories to get their feedback from a fact checking standpoint and then after I've I'm satisfied that that we've got everything right then it goes off to my head office where it goes through a very rigorous uh, fact checking and, and accuracy process as well so there's a lot of time invested uh, in doing that, and it's because it's so important. And we won't even get into plagiarism today, which I had hoped to talk a little bit about because, you know, we've got a lot of English students on the line, but obviously that is just off the table um, for anything. And yet, you know, we still have seen examples of, of people, even government, plagiarizing uh, work and having it published and then seeing really serious repercussions. Mm. Yeah. So I think we're going to head into, uh, because we are in those waning moments of our hour together, we're going to head into a little bit of a rapid round. And some of these questions will be unfair, but I'm going to ask them anyways. Um, I'm going to start with who your favorite poet or songwriter is. Heather. Oh, God. Um, Jamal. <laughs> hey, Jamal! <laughs> nice shout out. Jamal, you're up next. Favorite poet or songwriter? Favorite songwriter, Bob Marley. Excellent. Adrian? Uh, I'm going to say Linton Quasi Johnson. Thank you very much. Some good people to check out today. Megan, and this could be a playwright too for you. Oh, I chose a poet, Gwendolyn Brooks. Okay, fantastic. And Caroline. Uh, Irishman, John O'Donohue. John O'Donohue. Okay, we're going to go in reverse order now. Caroline, what novel influenced you the most as a child or teenager? Got to pick one. Judy Bloom. Got to say? Yeah, I can't think of the title, but I read all her Judy Bloom books. I love that she, it was like real, felt like a real person. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Yeah, and all those, yeah. Yeah. Megan. Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, yeah. that too. Adrian. You know, I'm going to say two. Uh, I'm going to say Crime and Punishment, uh, Dostoevsky, and I'm also going to say James Baldwin, Another Country. Okay. Jamal? This is your favorite novel? Yes. What influenced you as a kid? Something you read. What influenced me as a kid? Um, uh, Swiss Family Robinson. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and now, uh, Heather. Oh boy. That's a big question. It was, it was a long time ago. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> I, I read a lot of, um, uh, I can't remember her name, but it was the, the tales of the, uh, Beverly Cleary. I think yeah. it was the tales of the fourth grade, nothing and Ramona. 
And I think uh, she uh, just passed away. She did. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, she did. But, uh, yeah. But that, was, right. that was a while ago. In my when, youth. When do you write? What is your time of day that you write, Heather? Uh, I write all day long. Um, I fit it in between other things um, and I, I find I early morning when I'm up uh, having my coffee I can get a lot done but I uh, also write at 11 o'clock at night uh, during the day if there's time um, and I, I integrate other activities in my day as I like because I have that flexibility so. Adrian, when do you write? Uh, I have poor sleep hygiene, so <laughs> all the time, <laughs> probably the time. every hour, yeah, any, any hour of the day, yeah, unfortunately. Jamal, oh, <laughs> Jamal. I write when I can schedule it into my schedule, so whenever I have space to, uh, you know, take away uh, uh, some writing, uh, get some writing done, that's when I do it. <laughs> Megan. Um, I'm I'm a morning person, so if I if I can be writing by like eight, then probably my best stuff will come at ten. This is my general uh, thing, and I protect my time. I, I'm pretty committed to to working part time, so I have Fridays. Friday is my day. It's my writing day, and I I hold myself to it. Caroline, uh, I journal every morning so that's not anything that ever gets published but that's free writing every morning which I make my students do too and some of them don't like it but I tell them it's so worth it so worth it um, as for the writing projects I do like Jamal I'll schedule time and usually do like six to eight hour go deep go long kind of thing and then don't write for a couple of days after that but I feel like I'm always writing something in my head so I always have to have that with me or a paper or something to jot it down just because it, it the ideas pop up at the weirdest times. Okay, we're gonna sneak one last question in. So we'll ask each of you to be fairly succinct. Um, when I have writer's block, I, Adrian? Fight it to the death. <laughs> Jamal. I've never had writer's block. That's awesome. Heather. I put it away. And come back with fresh eyes. All right. Megan? I go for a walk and I usually talk to myself, talk it out while walking. Okay. And last but not least, Caroline. Uh, I do something else creative. I call it creative cross training. So I learn how to knit socks or learn how to watercolor, or learn how to mac macrame, just something totally different. And I think when you're doing those things, when your, your hands are busy, your yeah. mind starts going. Yeah. yeah. They call that flow. Well, I can't believe we're at 10 o'clock. Um, what an amazing hour. Uh, we can't thank our panelists enough today. Thank you so much, Heather Wright, Jamal Jackson Rogers, Adrian Harewood, Megan Pierce Monifu, and Caroline Pignat. You have been so generous with your time and your answers. And a massive, huge thank you to Christina Price Monfi for organizing today's event. Uh, you are the wind beneath our wings. Uh, and we couldn't have done it without you. And thanks also to our incredible moderator of the chat, uh, Sarah Abrams, my uh, partner in crime, I'm starting to get tongue-tied now. Lots of thank yous uh, coming up in the chat this morning. Um, so have a fantastic day, everyone, and hopefully, we, uh, hopefully our English students have learned a lot from today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank, thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.